Thank you so much for coming along to our Parliamentary Monitoring Community of Practice meeting today. We are excited to see you um, and your AI helpers and uh, talk about a subject which doesn't figure very often in our conversations, um, which is subnational parliamentary monitoring work. So as usual, before we get fully started, we've got a couple of housekeeping points. Um, so you'll know or you'll have noticed as you joined um, that there is a message saying recording in progress. So we're recording the presentations for those who can't attend, um, but we won't record the discussion side of things so people can speak freely. Please keep your mics on mute until we finish all the presentations, but do feel free to drop any questions into the chat as we go along. Um, Gemma and I can pick those up. Um, we've got an hour together in total and we'll be hearing from two groups um then we've got around 20 minutes afterwards to uh, discuss the concepts one of our presenters hasn't yet arrived so they may turn up um during if not we'll hear from julio and then alex can talk a little bit about our forays into um subnational work ourselves or our thoughts about what we might do um so without further ado our first speaker is Julio, who you may know or remember from Tic Tech um, earlier in the year. Julio comes from Open Knowledge Brazil. Um, and please take it away. Tell us about your work, Julio. Hi, thank you very much. I'll just share the slides here before I start. Come on, come on, come on, Zoom. Come on, <laughs> let's go. Okay. Okay. I will not be able to see you, but are you seeing the slides? Okay. Everything all right? We yeah, are. Thank you so much. Okay. Nice. Thank you very much for having me here. Yeah. I presented at Tic Tac. It was a great experience. I couldn't come to to London. Hopefully next year I will be able to. If <laughs> if uh, my presentation eventually gets accepted, and I have the the time and the agenda to to eventually to eventually come there. So it would be very nice to to meet you in person and get to know London a little bit. So. This presentation is a bit different from the one at Tic Tac because at Tic Tac we focus on Querido Diario. Here, Querido Diario is still the main focus, but I'll give a little bit of context and how it came to be and other activities we also are doing that that complements the Querido Diario history and uh, the action. So here we are focusing on monitoring parliament and prefectures, challenges and some success strategies that we, we came to be. Who am I? I'm dad. Uh, I'm a dad of three cats and a dog. They allow me to live at their house and they are very nice for, for that. I sometimes make pizzas. I, I, I like to, to eat good pizza and the ones I make are good. So I, I'm not very humble about it, but, but, <laughs> but so that's it. The, I come from uh, communities that are mainly civic tech, civic tech focused and Python, the Python programming language focused. And I'm very much an enthusiast of those communities, not necessarily the technology by itself, but what it, what it can do and the people behind it. We have a saying in the Brazilian Python community that is people uh, greater than technology. Uh, it's the, the greater than sign. And I try to apply it for everything in, in my professional and personal life. So I also am a civic innovation program manager at Open Knowledge Brazil. 
I will start the presentation uh, talking about open knowledge first. And my name is there. My my handle is there. Also, I'm currently on Telegram. It's the easiest. Uh, it LinkedIn and everything. It's the the same handle, but the easiest to to talk to me would be at Telegram. So, at Open Knowledge Brazil, we wait. Yeah, at Open Knowledge Brazil, is this is this right? This shouldn't be here. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> I'll go to the next slide. Uh, we are a non-profit, non-partisan civil society organization in Brazil. We have been uh, we have been online. Let's say that uh, since two thousand thirteen, and OKBR, like Open Knowledge Brazil, is part of this international network of chapters of the Open Knowledge Foundation. They are independent from each other, but they act as a network because we can we evaluate that this way we can share experiences more easily and have some co coordinated efforts, mainly uh, in this open internet and globalization. We the problems we face in Brazil are mostly similar to the problems we we face in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, and so everything is still connected. And most of our positions may, can be similar too. So uh, operating a network makes the most sense for us. Our mission is to develop civic tools, projects public policy analysis, training to promote open knowledge. We recognize that open knowledge is the a great factor for a strong civil uh, strong society. The civil society having access and means to implement their demand and implement their changes. So our vision, uh, that's our vision. Uh, so that's uh, we can generate great social benefits by what I just said. And also we have a focus on off online, but also offline because that's where, where most change is actually accessed by, by the, the civil society. We have some values that are respecting tolerance, responsibility and that in ethics, in data use, transparency, non-partisanship, diversity, and open source as a culture. And right, uh, now it's the, the correct time to, to present this slide. We have some programs. Our focus today will be the Civic Innovation Program, but we also have the School of Data, which is focusing on training and courses and uh bringing the data journalists to share their knowledge with each other and how to use data and promote the data to a greater audience and the school of data is also a chapter of the school of data but it's also totally independent and here is uh it, it is inside, let's say, the Open Knowledge Brazil programs. Uh, I will jump from civic innovation to advocacy and research, recognizing that most of our most of our actions can be done, should be done with other organizations beside us and also acting towards the the government and also working besides them we the advocacy and research deals mainly with our politics and and our analysis of of public policies that can promote more transparency and open governance we also do partnerships and and services so we have a vast amount of know-how of how to implement softwares, how to implement solutions, how to assess 
governmental problem. So we also view that if we use that knowledge for, for as a service for some prefecture, the, some form of government, they can implement those more quickly and the the population will be will be benefited more soon and so we we also do those kind of services our focus will be today at the civic innovation program as i said i'm program manager for the civic innovation program so this is this is my territory so i'll talk about it uh, at Civic Innovation Program, we focus on engagement, open technologies, and social control. So we don't, we mostly deal with open projects that are easily accessible, easily uh, contributable by, by the civil society but we not necessarily engage only in open projects and lines of code and everything we also recognize that uh, engagement by a community and forming a community can develop a bunch of other lines of action that not not necessarily just a, a project can can do so let's give an example with one network that we we maintain the ambassador network we were able to develop a an open letter for candidates to elections to affirm their compromise with open data and open open questions People can ask for information, open information of the of the campaign and of their administration. So this open letter would be signed by the candidates, and then the the people could demand that as a premise of their campaign. So that's one line of action that we actually didn't need, and any technology uh, and building any technology to do that. So I talked about uh, that we would give some background context for Querido Diario and also we'll, uh, talk about some parliamentary monitoring today. And this project, Operação Serenata de Amor, or Love Serenade Operation, it's, uh, it's a, a little joke about the, the, the Toblerone. Toblerone, I think, that was in Italy. And it's a project that focuses on collaborative, collaborative uh, demand to the to the parliament about their spendings. So if they have some suspicious spendings. We as a uh, we as the public as the the voters can demand that they explain what that purchases what the that purchase was, and then uh, that could be they could be held accountable by their by their activity if the suspicion was proved to be a fraud or something like that. So. Here is a public panel that we maintain. It's Jarbas, the the, the name of a, a butler, and the Jarbas is just a jungle admin, public the jungle public admin dashboard that has all the 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 purchases and reimbursements that the that the parliament, that the the congress people actually spend, and then we have Rosie, which is our classifier that can classify that spending as a suspicious activity or not. She was also a Twitter bot that broadcasted the those suspicious activities. And would tag the handle of the of the the Congress people, but 
in 2018, Twitter, and, and let's say some Congress people were not happy with that, and they flagged Rosie as a bot spammer because they were tagging the, the Congress people, and Twitter actually took action against the bot activity, and it it was out for like months the the engagement with rosie declined a bunch and when it got when we could got get it back it couldn't tag the the congress people anymore and that was a that was mostly the the reason for the decline in uh, operação serenata de amor activity because the Twitter bot was not as effective. And right now, I don't know if you know, Twitter is is banned in Brazil for now and while they don't have a legal representative in the country. So Rosie is not working and I believe we will not get it back to work because we have political, political divergence with the the Twitter administration right now. So rip rosy but as long as it was in in activity more than 8000 suspicions were detected more than 800 official reports were made to our chamber of deputies more than 130 reimbursements were reclaimed and that amounts to at least 5000 reais our currency and uh, at 2018, people were trying to bring that experience of Serenata de Amor to their cities. So how can we implement to the, those things we do for the federal government, the Congress people, to our cities? But in cities, the how we, we say that in Brazil, the the whole is is uh, goes deeper <laughs> o buraco é mais embaixo uh, things are a little harsher we don't have mostly we don't have apis structured data and things that can make much easier or feasible a classification problem like that we have in Serenata de Amor. So the decision was to, okay, we don't have those data, we don't have that data available for us to do Serenata de Amor straight, straight away, but we can try to make it easier for implementing Serenata de Amor in the future. So let's, re let's solve the problem we face right now, that is data availability, data accessibility, and bring it to a centralized platform where people can see their governmental movement in their, in their cities. And then if we are able to gather this amount of data of more than 5,000 cities, because Brazil has 5,570 cities, we will be able to eventually also develop some structuring for those for those for that data and maybe serenata de amor will be possible uh, at the city level in that horizon so querido diario was started in 2018 right now it was it is a uh, it was launched actually in 2021 our first mvp and right now it offers full text search, sorry, full text search on more than uh, almost 500 cities, advanced search, city and date filters, downloadable results. And we also have open data, an API that enables other projects to be made like this one in the right here. Uh, Diários do Clima is a, is a project that narrows the, the, 
the gazettes, the the gazettes of our cities, the to the climate and environment related acts. So the gazettes publish a bunch of stuff. They uh, they can be exonerations, nominations, contracts, uh, every everything from. the the application of uh, a fine to the pro to the promotion of a law a new law so a bunch of these will not be related to climate and environment and it, it's use, it's useful for the public to get a limited amount of data so they can work with and not having to filter that and manually and get to the the topic they want to see in the In the gazettes. So the Ares do Clima is an is a project that is enabled by this by this offer of an open API. So <clears throat> we currently have four hundred forty nine cities in Kiribati. We are growing rapidly rapidly right now. We are at seven seven hundred thousand documents at the moment and. Our focus primarily were in the largest cities in Brazil. So these 400 uh, cities already account for 61 million people in Brazil. For We have more than 5,000 cities, a population of around 200 million people, but focusing on large cities first, uh makes it possible to reach 61 million with just less than 10 percent of the cities but right now we are also focusing on small cities because that's where that's where again the buraco is rising <laughs> the the whole runs runs deeper so uh we have some we already have some uh, where Uh, it's, this is just a, a brief compilation of some results in Querido Diário. At Tic Tac, I was able to show much more because I had more time. But this is a compilation of the of some journalistic articles that were made using Querido Diário. So the invisibility in black, of black and peripheral culture in the capital of Bahia. The city council maintains suspension of regulations defining gender debate in schools of Manaus. The Florianopolis City Hall abandons work to welcome vulnerable women and young people. And yesterday, Spectre, today, a partner. Anti-flood system maintenance company hired its own inspector from Porto Alegre City Hall. And this was all... implemented using the Querido Diário. Uh, there were journalistic articles that mentioned Querido Diário in their, in their body. We have a bunch more examples of these journalistic articles in our use case section in the, site, in the website. We have more we have more articles that cover Querido Diário specifically, it's recognition in the media, it's very valuable to us. And this is a project that does a lot of impact through community engagement. We have 5,000 cities to cover. We have to develop scrapers and like robots automatized robots to get the data from the the perf the the site the website that publishes it individually so a lot of people that are like experienced or maybe new to open source to the open source community uh can contribute at their own city. It's a very welcoming project for for newbies. It's like maybe most of our, our contributors are making their first contribution to open source through Querido Diário. We also we also recognize our our role in 
uh, being a, a entry for these people to the open source community. So it's a very community driven project and it's been a great success until now. It's one of the biggest uh, civic tech projects in Brazil at the moment. And to end here, we also have one one other project that we have in civic innovation that is the ambassador network that focuses on helping querido diario being built but also that example i i brought earlier of offline engagement normal network engagement to debate to implement to demand civic uh, participation and open data and transparency, open government in every in every state of Brazil. So we are we actually created the network to be a hub for people that want to implement some civic engagement in their cities. Thank you very much. We have this this QR code will point to our to Open Knowledge Brazil website and we also have our handles here if you want to to know us for GitHub, Discord. We don't have a Twitter. As I said, Twitter is banned. But we are moving to Macedon and Blue Sky at the moment. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julio. That was really, really interesting. Um, so our next presenter is Felipe. Um, Felipe is from Datos Que Hacen Ciudad in Colombia. Um, I think you should be able to present your screen, Felipe, if you've got any um, slides, if you want to. Um, so I'll pass over to you. You are muted at the moment, Felipe, sorry. Hey, can you guys hear me now? Perfect. All right, uh, so thank you for this space. I, I know I'm showing uh, Google. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit as we go on. That's not a mistake. Uh, so my name is Felipe Aramillo. I am a professor here at La Javeriana Cali. I'm part of Cali Visible, and we have an alliance of Datos Que Hacen Ciudad. And we, I'm, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the observatory, and then I'll show you a little bit about Datos Que Hacen Ciudad to find how we articulate um, different data in order to create a civil awareness, in order to promote more democratic practices. Basically, that's what we do together. So as common trend um, here at La Jardiana Cali, we have, if you go to the main page and you go to research, it's in Spanish, but if you go to research, Investigación, and you go to Cali Visible. Um, sorry, no, I, I made a mistake, but you go to Investigación, there, and you go Cali Visible, you'll find the observatory. So the observatory is one of the institutions that make up Cali Ciudad. So I'm going to explain to each of them. And as we go, if you have any questions, let me know. So what do we do uh, at the observatory? We are an observatory of leadership, basically, and political leadership. And we want to foster political leaderships that try to promote inclusion, democracy, respect human rights, sustainability, and um, also transparency as part of our research. The, the theory of change is that if we give people information uh, and leaders information, they will make decisions that are more adequate for democracy. So that's basically the theory of change that we have as a, as a community. And at the observatory, in order to advance that theory of change, we have four main axes. So the first is we do research. Uh, we Right now in the Consejo de Cali, as the uh, Council of Cali is one of the bodies that controls the, the, the administration, the public administrations. So we do research on the Council of Cali and we try to analyze how are they trying to avoid practices of corruption, 
or how, I don't know, you know, this is not something we're very proud of, but Italy has very high feminicide rates. So how are they trying to um, pressure the public administration to take measures regarding uh, that problem that we have? So we do research trying to analyze how um, these topics come into the public arena and how the council tries to push certain topics forward. Uh, I'll explain that a little bit farther ahead. The second is what we do a lot of training, uh, formacion, uh, which the main aim is to give students and citizens information of how can they make a, a decision when, while they're voting, but also how can they also have democratic deliberations that are a little bit more based on facts rather than simply on what's being said on Twitter or TikTok. Um, so try to provide that information. And that generates, the uh, last one is uh, how can we, advocacy, incidencia, is how can we actually create alliances with governments and with other organizations to change the way leadership works in Colombia so we avoid uh, corruption practices. And the last axis is Datos que hacen Ciudad, which is part of this alliance that we constructed with other observatories that uh, gather data. So that's basically the structure of our observatory. Uh, if we go here, I'll, again, I'll begin with Cali Visible, which is part of the of our main um, uh, observatory that gathers data. In the council, what we try to do is we, we have close relations with these counselors. Uh, we have constant relations with them, and we try to gather data on the different propositions that they try to acquire, uh, how they propose certain things in terms of agenda settings. So we we did, um, that allows the two-way communications. First, we, we give them data, but they also provide data of what are the main problems in the city. And that allows to do uh, social control of seeing how they're doing their work, but also allows us to give, us, give them information to do their work better. So it's a two-way uh, dialogue. And that, that was, that uh, that was Casa Ciudad, seeks to do exactly that, to gather data from public administration, but also to give these people that occupy positions of power, that are in positions of leadership, data so they can make um, general um, bank matter decisions. So in terms of datos que hacen ciudad en Cali Visible, you could go here at the page and you go visualizaciones, you'll find uh, how we gather our data and a little bit about the information we've gathered. Um, um, so here we could find by each counselor what type of propositions they do. So I don't know if this is big enough, but for example, if I filter through Anerazo, there's uh, five women counselors versus there's 21 uh, in total. So there's five women counselors versus 16 men. And I'll show you that data in terms of gender because it's really interesting. So we try to find what uh, type of political control they do. If they get, for example, the secretary of education to come and to give like a report of what's being done in education. So what is the theme, the main theme they try to do with their propositions, their political control. So whether it's public finance, mobility, security, transparency, uh, issues regarding gender, education, and we could filter by themes uh, and also by uh, SDG. So for example, if it's related to justice or um, sustainable cities, so you could also filter by SDG, which allows us to have a wider conversation of how uh, political uh, monitoring is related to these greater uh, topics related to SDG. So over here, you could basically filter by, um, by the person and you could figure out how many propositions it made during the period and what were the main topics. Right now, uh, for example, we just showed, uh, this is a graph of what uh, a research we're constructing. And what we see, for example, is that during the COVID, and this is actually confirms much of the research on gender and the impact on COVID, women uh, counselors, even though they're the minority, they make the most propositions, then they make more propositions than men. They're more active than men. In general, there was only one period during the history of the council where men make more propositions than women, which was during the COVID period, which that's very telling. If you look, uh, there's plenty of data that shows that 
when COVID, with the restrictions, women had to assume not only their labors as public counselors, but also at home. And it has shown that, for example, in the academia, women researchers' publications went down drastically while men research actually grew. So we are actually confirming that uh, the impact of COVID in regards to public policy and public making. So that also is very telling. Um, we we also did it by, by topic and it allows us to filter out by topic whether women have um, trying to promote certain topics more than men, right? And we do not find a distinction right now. Well, we're gonna, here you can find by men. So women tend to prioritize uh, issues of security, justice, mobility, and environment. And when we talk about men is security, mobility, and environment. So they share kind of the same thing. So this idea that <clears throat> also from feminist research, whether women have specific sensibility, at least in regards to these topics, we have not found uh, a profound uh, difference in terms of gender and the data we gather. Um, sorry, I'm going a little bit fast, but I, I kind of want to show you the, the whole thing we, we do. And <clears throat> in here, you could also find the information just more general in regards to the, the council and how it has advanced in terms of uh, political control. So a little bit of the council is how many propositions they've made during this period. And you could find which were the topics that are more relevant, right? And that allows us to give you information of what are the topics on the agenda that are a priority for a city, right? And um, one of the things that's fundamental is issues of mobility, right? Mobility and security are priorities here in the and in, in the council during this last period. So if you also click here through um, the, the view of the propositions, we could also do a qualitative research of analyzing how these propositions were framed, who they, uh, for example, suppose you have an issue of access to, if lack of justice in regards to access of education. The question is, do you cite or do you, who do you invite to uh, provide um, accountability, whether it's the Secretary of Education or the Secretary of Justice? So those kind of strategic decisions of who are you calling to give you data on public administration, th this allows us to, to know what was a preposition and who, uh, who came and what institution uh, came to give the information regarding that. Um, so uh, right here, I'm just when um, we go to, so that's the observatory and that's like the main data we have. We also have one uh, last one that I think it's important that you see. So we go is in regards to elections. So one of the questions that we hit is who are these counselors? Who are they being elected by, right? And uh, whether they represent these people. So if we look at the political map, and this allows us to, to also look at how these uh, counselors are elected, um, you could see, for example, where in, in the map, like where they gather most of their data and where like do they get, uh, if, for example, if it's Comuna Uno, how they voted in certain localities, how they vote in another locality. So we could see how votes are distributed by locality, see if there's a difference in locality. And that allows us also to uh, look which political parties, for example, in Liberal, like where did the political party, the liberal political party win versus where did the Green Party win? So that allows us to know which party has more influence in each locality. Um, and then we cross that which we have not found the information, but we imagine specifically that based on these political parties, they would have certain agendas, but rather what we've seen is that the priorities tend to be the same always, like security, mobility, uh, as the main issues that come. They do switch, uh, they did switch uh, during the COVID period, health became one of the main issues. So that's also kind of interesting how the agenda goes, switches um, throughout the time and throughout time periods. Um, so 
here, uh, now we go to Datos que hacen Ciudad. Uh, it's this broader alliance. This is not only part of La Jaria de Cali, a Cali Visible, but it's a group of uh, organizations that gather together. So we have uh, organizations that come from Universidad del Valle, uh, that they have uh, support from different organizations. And what we do is try to create data um, to, to see how Cali is doing, right, in general, and how they're doing in general. So when we go here at Visor de Datos and Visores de Calidad de Vida, so we could get data on different issues. It's the same kind of the same logic as Cali Visible. They, they work on the same data. Um, so if you want to find, for example, issues of mobility, of environment, of culture, uh, it's kind of interactive here. I, I don't know if mobility is a bus. Uh, and then my environment is like a tree and culture. So if you click like, oh, I want to know information about mobility, right? And um, so, for example, you want to know how many cars are there registered because you want to make a decision in regards to cars. So you could find like how the car industry has grown drastically in Cali in the last couple of years. Uh, it came from 2005 when we had 373,000 uh, 373, cars versus doubled today, right? So um, again, the, the theory of change is if one of the main issues is mobility, how is mobility being advanced? So we want to give them data in regards to that. Um, you could also think about like new number of motorcycles, how it has grown. And it's been crazy. If you look from 2005 till now, uh, I don't know if you've had the privilege to come to Cali. Cali is beautiful, but the motorcycles are crazy. Uh, it's just like very hectic. It's quite dangerous. We have the highest mortality rate when it comes to motorcycles. And then we try to explain this based on data. And we see that the exponential growth of motorcycle from 70,000 to 238,000 motorcycles in less than 20 years, right? So, so you see that this expansion of the motorcycles. And here you can look at the number of people that have died uh, from motorcycles every year, right? So 200, right in the, what's going on in 2023, 28, 283 people uh, died in motorcycle accidents, um, accident, uh, transit accidents. And you could also say how many, for example, have made it, uh, gotten like uh, a ticket, right? How many people get tickets? And, and you find like the administration has gotten more tickets. So for example, if you want to cross the information to know like, does giving more people tickets reduce the number of accidents? You could do that information here. You can gather that information. The theory would be that the stricter the administration is, the more tickets they give you, then you would have more people respecting the rules and consequently you would have less people dying, uh, which uh, not necessarily is the case. But you could also look at, for example, public administration, how um, how many vehicles we have in uh, public bus buses, uh, how many people uh, how many people use public buses, and all the information where that we gather this information is right here. Um, when we look at again the data annually, <clears throat> one of the things I, I my research is mostly on on issues of of gender and security. So if you look at security and uh, issues of statistics, uh, total number of homicides, uh, unfortunately we have um, a great number of our history in, in terms of homicides. But if you look in 2005, we had 1,577 1, homicides. Um, and now we have uh, 1,000. So there is a progression uh, there's a reduction in the number of homicides. Drastic, even if it doesn't seem drastic, it's quite drastic as one third of the homicides have gone down, uh, which is quite interesting. But you could also look at the number of homicides in terms of gender. Uh, most men, uh, I'm not talking about uh, domestic violence or femicide, I'm just most homicides are, uh, most of the people killed are men. Um, drastic difference, right? But when we talk about um, femicides, uh, 
see if I can show you the data, or no, number of cases of uh, intro of uh, domestic violence, violence intrafamiliar, so intro familiar violence, sorry, <laughs> domestic violence. Um, the, 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 the data is so different, right? Uh, the data shows that domestic violence uh, in 2023, there were 544 cases of men versus 2023, uh, sorry, uh, 2,438 number of cases of violence against women inside their house. So also this gives you data in regards to the different logics of violence. Uh, I, I've already spoken quite a lot, so I'm just going to, because... I, I do, I know I only had 10 minutes, so I'm, I'm gonna go really quickly and to conclude. So basically our theory of change is if we give people data, they could make better citizen decisions, but also if we give people that are empowered data, they could make better political control, right? So if we give the consejo data, then they could make actual decisions of how they could change the city. Our theory of change is that information creates stronger democracies, stronger protection of human rights, and makes better uh, decision-making. Uh, and that's what we hope to do with this alliance. And the, the whole idea is that you get the opportunity to navigate through this data. Uh, we could have information regarding culture, regarding council, regarding uh, how much is invested in culture, how much is invested in sports, how uh, demographics have changed drastically throughout the years, how much taxes uh, you can gather or how much has changed in terms of taxes, education, how many people have changed in regards to how many people are rec uh, uh, in schools versus how many people were in the past. And that's how much, for example, how much it has grown in terms of the people uh, studying and so on. Yes, so I, 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 sorry I extended a little bit uh, of my presentation, but that's basically what it is that was, that I asked you that and any information, any questions you have, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was super, super interesting. And it's really interesting to see the two different approaches to, to kind of looking at this.